So this is where we were on corporate credit spreads. Okay, so we keep it at 100. Can you guys see? Sahil, can you see on the last bench? Okay, so we've, uh, we've come, we were look, discussing corporate credit spreads. So one of the things you have to remember is that uh, when you're, whenever you're tracking uh, the total cost of debt for a corporate, obviously what are the two components of the total cost of debt for a corporate? Yeah, so the government bond yield plus the credit spread. Okay, so when you are doing uh, what we were talking about, I think we had used this link for the double AA, uh, BAA credit spread. So, what we were talking about is essentially how I think the last discussion, last part of the discussion in the previous class was on uh, why uh, in everything you do in finance, you'll have to basically take a view on markets. Because if you are going to, if you are working for a corporate treasury and you're look, doing a debt capital markets issuance, you have to take it to call on now, normally what happens is you issue if you do the paperwork okay you do the paperwork and you have a certain window like for instance in, in india you have something called a shelf offering which is there internationally as well but the rule in india is if you do a shelf a shelf prospectus you have a one year window so you can get all your legal pay that's meant to basically um, allow people to time the market properly okay so uh, you do a shelf prospectus and then you have a one year window anywhere within any time within that one year you can go ahead and execute the issue okay so this is what how, so there are different time frame in different jurisdictions the time frame will differ but typically that's how it works you get the legal approvals regulatory approvals and then you wait and you have a certain window in which you can uh, make use of that time and uh, optimally time the market so every every kind of uh, corporate uh, decision in with regard to finance involves taking a call on markets because obviously if you decide that you're going to go ahead with the issue that means you're one of the things if you assume that the corporate bond deal is not going to change much okay so here we're looking at the spread okay here we're looking at the credit spread okay because it's corporate bond deal minus uh, 10 year treasury so we're looking at the credit spread so you can notice it's around two and a half percent it's 2.3 percent so if you go ahead and do the issue and let's uh, uh, assume that you don't uh, you, you feel that the corporate bond deal the government bond deal is not going to move much okay it is constant we'll come to that this is the set risk paribus assumption essentially if you are assuming uh, if, if you are going ahead with the issue that means if you that means you feel that corporate credit spreads are likely to rise further that is your total cost of debt will go up this is clear a set risk paribus argument if you are just assuming that the government bond yield will not move okay so essentially what that means is that takes us to the next part of the uh, the discussion which is that uh, you have to be tracking but obviously in real life the government bond yield also moves so if you are at the point i'm trying to emphasize here because this entire module is on the skill sets that you need to operate in different roles in the financial sector right so one of the skill sets because remember in corporate treasury the most important function is capital raising and the bulk of capital raising is in the form of debt so one of the important jobs you'll have is in time one of the important skill sets you need to have is how to optimally time the market obviously that's not a science okay you have to evolve but you have to focus on this aspect this is what you have to be focused on you have to be tracking the credit spread you have to be tracking the movement of the credit spread and taking a view on which way the credit spread is going to go and you also have to be tracking the the this is the u.s 10-year treasury which is what has been subtracted from the total corporate bond deal to give you the credit spread okay so remember the market normally works in terms of the debt market discussions which happen as you will see in the saudi bond pricing case they don't normally involve in the case of corporate bonds and for any sovereign which is not issuing in its own currency so if if argentina is issuing us dollar bonds they will get treated like any other corporate as far as the discussion the framework of the discussion is concerned okay so any so so what will happen is you you will basically the the discussion in the market is in terms of the spread over the treasury the spread over the government bond benchmark if we want to talk in general terms okay if you want to talk in us dollar bond uh, with respect to the us dollar bond markets we can talk about the us treasury so when you're talking about us dollar bond markets the discussion is going to be of corporate bond pricing the discussion of corporate bond pricing is going to be in terms of a spread over the treasury they will not discuss it in terms of an all-in rate okay because everybody knows where the treasury is they know how to find out the yield on the treasury so the discussion is only in terms of the negotiation happens in terms of the spread over the treasury so yeah yeah what i'm trying to say is if you look at the debt market parlance okay how the debt market discusses discusses corporate bond issues okay 
essentially what they would discuss is they are going to discuss the whole corporate bond yield okay the yield on the corporate bond they're going to discuss it in terms of a uh, spread over treasuries they will not discuss outright rates okay they will not discuss discuss an all-in yield of six percent six and a half percent they will discuss the negotiation that happens okay the negotiation that happens is in the form of a spread over treasuries so the investor whether the institutional investor if you're like on the distribution side of a debt capital markets operation okay if you're on the distribution side of a what what uh, distribution will happen in primary capital markets or secondary capital markets primary, primary. primary. primary capital markets. so if you're within the debt uh, the DCM division of, a, of an investment bank in the primary capital markets if you are on the distribution side if you are going to investors and trying to sell them various bonds issue, bond issues like Argentina is coming up Intel is coming up okay uh, and with, with bond issues and you're trying to sell them to the investor so the investor the institutional investor is going to ask in term so he's going to ask okay I want I, I'm happy to buy this uh, kingdom of Saudi Arabia bonds but uh, what spread are you paying over treasuries okay and remember the other point that we discussed every time you discuss an interest rate you have to always be clear about one is the tenor what tenor are you talking about and the other is who is the what is the credit grade of the issuer yes, the credit rating of the issuer okay or credit grade of the issuer so essentially the issuer's name and then from there you find out the credit grade because without that it doesn't make any sense because as you can see here the at any point of time this is only the BAA spread if you look at this chart at any point of time obviously there are you can see that the the higher rated corporate bonds have a lower spread than the lower rated corporate bonds okay so therefore unless you have also specified the credit grade credit grade of the issuer the discussion of the interest rate does not make any sense it's not complete is this clear okay so uh, the the point that will happen the what will happen the discussion that will happen between the institutional bond investor and the distribution guy from the DCM division of within the primary capital markets of an investment bank is going to be the guy will say the investor the portfolio manager uh, who is going to be buying the debt is going to say okay I'm happy to buy the Saudi bonds but what spreads are you offering over treasuries for each of the maturities the treasury would be Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia treasury no if you're using in US dollar if you're using a, issuing a US dollar bonds a bond you will be benchmarking against US treasuries okay if you're using a Japanese yen bond then you'll be benchmarked against uh, Japanese government bonds okay so that's where the benchmark that's how the benchmarking will work so this is so the, is this point clear that the discussion in corporate debt markets happens in terms of credits for corporate uh, debt will happen in terms of a credit spread the people don't discuss how much are you going to pay me six percent seven percent they will say how much what BP spread are you paying for each tenor okay what BP spread over treasuries so as a if you're working on the corporate treasury side for a corporate trying to raise debt you have to monitor both you have to monitor because both of these things will affect your uh, total cost of debt so you have to keep an eye when you when it comes to timing the market if you look at this if you look at if you take the maximum data we don't have a lot of data here you have to be aware of these long-term cycles at least we have it from say 86 you can see how credit spreads have moved for BAA which is just about investment grade one notch below this you go into junk okay so you can have a, you should have a historical perspective you should always look at long-term charts you should have a historical perspective on credit spreads and where do you think they're going that's one thing you have to track and you also have to track obviously the treasury bond yield as well right because that is also going to affect your cost because your total cost is credit spread plus bond yield and this bond yield is not constant obviously in the real world or we, we assume that as part of our Cetris Paribus discussion of the credit spread just a while earlier but in the real world as you can see the bond yield is not constant okay so therefore you will have to monitor both because both of them are affecting your corporate credit, uh, your total cost of debt okay you have to take a take a view on both the markets and and uh, then accordingly uh, take your decision is this clear to everybody yeah yeah yes sir give him the mic if we can let's use the mic if we can so credit spread will be different for, diff for different maturity yes yes we'll see the that higher the maturity higher the credit spread not necessarily it depends on the market's view remember higher higher mm. credit spread is if, if a credit spread is higher uh, let's say let's go back to the original form of the discussion if the credit spread is has been rising mm. that means what is the debt market expecting uh, what is what does that tell us about 
So that means the debt market is expecting an economic downturn. Mm. Okay. So if let's say for instance now you, uh, some of the people in the US have the view that there's going to be a recession in say 2019, late 2019 or 2020. Okay. Mm. But by uh, late 2020, it will recover. Huh. So if that is the market's view, then obviously it will affect the views mm. of let's say two year debt, two year at the two year point, yes. credit spreads might be a little bit high. Okay. But if the view is that after that, there'll be a strong recovery. Mm. then maybe for five year debt it won't be so high so it is possible it's not necessary that credit spreads will always be higher for higher uh, uh, periods for higher tenors normally you would expect that but it's not necessary that it's always the case you have to be this is not a law of physics because it depends on market views okay so it can change but the point is that there'll be different credit spreads obviously for uh, different maturities okay so now if we go back to our so is this point clear that as, as, a, as a corporate treasury you'll have to monitor both your total cost is debt is affected by the government bond yield as well as the credit spread so you have to take a view on both the markets okay and then accordingly do your uh, issue time your bond issue okay so let's go back to Okay, now let's look at this case that we are doing in uh, in um, for the Saudi bond uh, issuance. This is actually a real. Um, this is all uh, uh, real uh, uh, stuff that actually happened in the markets. Okay, so all the pricing is taken from these. Uh, unfortunately, these things have now gone. Uh, these articles have now gone behind a paywall, so I can no longer read the full article. Okay, but you guys will be able to read ten articles, and after that, you get hit by the paywall. Okay. So uh, anyway, so what you can do is you can read the full story. Maybe what you can do is because this is a, uh, this is an interesting story. So maybe what you can do is open it up first uh, because you'll be able to read the full story. Then save the story as a PDF. Okay. Uh, screenshot is not uh, nice to look at later on. PDF is much better. I think if you try to print it, it, uh, it goes into a PDF. If you try to save it, it goes into a PDF, right? Then save it as a PDF. Then you have it online. Uh, I mean, you have it available, right? Offline. Okay, so what happens is initially Saudi goes into the, and this is what I said, okay, the indicative, there's this concept of indicative pricing and final pricing. So the indicative pricing is the, ba is the, pri is the basis on which you have the discussions. So you do a roadshow, you go into these, uh, so the first story you'll notice is on, uh, based on market talk, uh, based on the uh, Saudi uh, uh, tre treasury team going to uh, various centers like London, New York, trying to meet bond investors. This is called a roadshow. You know what a red, ro you heard this term roadshow? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is called a roadshow where the issuer, the potential issuer goes to various financial centers and talks to potential investors. So you have a meeting arranged. Okay. Uh, and you talk to the investment bankers will arrange meetings with all the uh, potential investors. And then the issuer goes and makes a presentation to these investor teams. Okay. Uh, at these roadshows. And this is how they add that that's where they discuss the indicative pricing so as you can see here the initial indicative pricing was can everyone see clearly everyone can see yes sir okay so uh five years 160 okay this is me what does 160 mean yeah so what does that mean that they are offering 1.6 percent they were discussing when they were doing the negotiations okay you know i want to sell bonds and this is what i'm thinking of offering does that suit you and then you go back and forth on the negotiations etc so initially when they started the discussion the discussion was in terms of the indicative pricing was in these terms okay five year this 10 year this and 30 year this okay these are the and the total issue size that is also something of interest so typically you also disclose what is your rough amount of issues that you're looking at this is clear to everyone this is how the discussion happens and so this article will you notice that it says that the spreads are 60 bp uh, on average the spreads are about 60 bp higher than the qatari bonds the qatari sovereign dollar bonds that are trading that is about 60 bp higher than uh, uh, sorry uh, the the yield on those qatari sovereigns are actually 60 bp lower across the curve here uh, compared to the saudi indicative pricing okay right so qatar is uh, known for which commodity
What? Commodity. Uh, not, uh, not airline. I said commodity. Qatar is no, no. You guys should know this. This Qatar is very close to us. And we have actually a very big deal with Qatar. Natural gas. Qatar has, I think, the world's largest reserves of natural gas. Okay, and we had a big natural gas. We still have that arrangement. We changed some of the terms of the arrangement. So India buys a lot of natural gas from Qatar. Okay, so um, now, so so this is basically this is some this is all things that you guys should be aware of. Okay, so eventually what happens is so this is how the indicative pricing happens, and the eventual pricing turns out to be much better because when they actually launch the issue, okay, after the indicative pricing, they will actually launch the issue and then it goes live okay then you're supposed to submit bids okay and eventually what happens to the final pricing can you see is it better or worse here i've actually <laughs> i've already given you the clue <laughs> so i should maybe delete this now you've already seen the answer you've already seen the answer so if this is the indicative pricing so this indicative pricing is registered yes that is what i was telling you that in debt back in debt capital markets the discussion on bond deals is basically on corporate uh, any corporate or any sovereign who is not not issuing in their own currency like kingdom of saudi arabia is a sovereign okay but if, because they're not issuing in saudi rials they are issuing in us dollars their discussion of their pricing will also be the same as as if like say airtel or intel uh, issuing bonds as a corporate the discussion framework is the same okay is this clear to everyone okay so the final pricing is much better for saudi can you see that five year drops from 160 to 135 30 year drops from 235 to 210 this is the final pricing so the, finally the bonds were issued at these spreads all right so if i just so uh, this was the first price and this is the acceptance yeah that is the initial discussion like if i'm trying to sell you my house i'll say i want to sell it for two pros and then we go up and down on discussions then you say no i can't pay that much can you make it 1.9 or something like that and then eventually maybe the deal will go through at 1.92 or something like that so that's how it happens right so is this clear okay so the final pricing as you can see is this is how so eventually what you see and and then you see something else here that there is the uh, the what happens to the total issue size they start out by discussing 10 billion Sorry, increase. it is increased to 17, 17 and a half billions okay billion 17 and a half billion because there is excessive demand uh, for the, the very high demand for the bonds when they launched the issue they found that there's very high demand for the bonds okay so that's why the that explains the collapse in the spreads that explains the collapse of the spreads from the indicative pricing but the indicative pricing is just one or two days before the uh, actual uh, if you see the report okay so just saying the difference in the pricing because bonds are traded actively trading in the market of the us but in case of india it is not possible to have the this pricing difference no no one minute let me just explain what i'm saying the point i'm trying to notice at uh, why why are we discussing this case lit there are two points to notice obviously you have to learn that which we have already discussed earlier that the discussion of uh, when a corporate debt issue is being priced okay uh, if the discussion is not in terms of an absolute yield of 6.7 or 7 7.2 the discussion in terms of, is in terms of spreads to the benchmark the discussion happen the entire discussion negotiation happens in terms of spreads to the benchmark that is how the discussion happens okay and then uh, the second and the other thing to notice is that uh, because there is excess demand so there is also something called indicative pricing when they discuss in the road shows and then you have the final pricing when the issue is launched this is when you're launching live when you're putting in live bids the institutional investors the bond investors they will have to put in live bids that means you're good for this amount okay then you enter like if i want to buy 500 million if i'm working for say pimco as a bond fund manager i will have to enter a bid for 500 million that means that's a firm price I mean that's a firm commitment okay so i'm signing up for uh, 500 million 10-year bonds at uh, at a yield of 165 over okay that means that this pricing is fine and i'm entering the bid okay so uh, so this is final pricing so you have indicative pricing discussion then you have the final pricing so the other point to notice in this case is that that the indica indicative pricing was at a certain level but when the final issue goes through the pricing is much more favorable to saudi arabia Yes. And the excessive demand, uh, the excess demand for the bonds, because there's excess demand for the bonds, uh, it causes two things to happen. It causes the first, it causes the indicative spreads to collapse, 
Yes. Okay, the final pricing is much more favorable than the at much for lower spreads. And the second is that also gives Saudi Arabia an option to upsize the offering. Like when you go to McDonald's, they ask you, right? If you want to upsize, you want to upsize your meal, yes. right? Yes. Huh? Every time we do this, and at last we find it was more expensive. What? By opting for okay <laughs> at McDonald's. So Saudi, the Saudis have upsized their bond issue. Okay, so they have ups, uh, opted for this is called a green shoe, uh, green shoe option, where there's an option to uh, basically increase the size of the issue. You'd have a discussion of on in terms of 10 billion, but then finally you end up issuing 17 and a half billion because you find that there's very uh, strong demand for the bonds. So the point to notice here is that when you have excess demands, two things can happen. That one is that the indicator spread will collapse in the final pricing and the second is that the size of the bond issue can be increased okay by exercising the green show is everyone clear now okay so this is how debt price is so eventually what will happen is when you see um, so when you see the final uh, news wire if you're monitoring news wise if you're working corporate treasury you will see that let's say whatever um, we just talk about one of those um, I'm just giving a do 30 years from 16 is 46. Price 30 was priced at 210 over. Okay. So the 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 news feed that you will see if you are monitoring, uh, you know, in corporate treasury, you will have access to wires like. Uh, you know, international uh, financing review, etc., which cap cover the capital markets, who is issuing where, anywhere in the world. So those wires will give you a news release, something like this: KSA 5% bonds due 2046, priced at 210 over. Okay, what this means essentially is that 5 this bond rate. 5% is the coupon rate. Yes, and 2046 is the maturity. Yes. And 2010 is above, that is above. Not 2010, 210. 210, sorry, two. above indicative pricing or above base points, that is over. No, don't say indicative pricing anymore because this is price, this kind of report when it comes out means Final that prices. this is the issue has already been launched and completed. Okay. okay, they're reporting on the issue completed. So, a price that 210 over means this is, has been the final price up based on the interaction of demand and supply. Okay. So, 210 above treasuries, which means you have to work out this is obviously coming out. You know this which is date. The increase size of the offering. Yeah, I wrote 2046 because this case study is from 2016. Okay. So the 30 year bonds have uh, will mature in 2046. Yeah. So the 30 years, so this is how the news release will come out. KSA 5% bonds due 2046, priced at 210 over. Which means you know that Kingdom of Saudi Arabia credit risk has been priced at 210 over 30 year treasury. Huh? 210 final price. 210 is the final price. Okay. So 210 over means now if you want to find out the total yield on that, you'll have to go and find out what is the 30 year treasury, US treasury yield. Go to the US treasury website. Go and find out what the 30 year US Treasury yield is, and then uh, you'll add 2.1% 2, 2 to that, and then you'll find out how much Saudi Arabia paid in uh, on an all in basis for 30 year bonds. Is everyone clear? Okay, all right. So, all this stuff is already written here, okay. And then, obviously, what happens is if you do floating rate stuff, okay, now so far we've discussed fixed rate. Fixed. If you do floating rate, the same concept, so we'll try to save some time by not uh, increasing. If anybody has a problem, you can ask me later. Okay, so the same thing, uh, let's let's look at another example. So floating rate, LIBOR, everyone understands? Okay, okay. and what is HIBOR? HIBOR is an I-5 HIBOR. Haryana Interbank offer rate. Think of any other big financial center which thinks about London is with Hong Kong. Hong Kong Interbank offer rate, okay. So you have LIBOR, you have, uh, then Mibor. we also have MIBOR as well, Mibor. Mumbai Interbank offer rate, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, then you have CYBOR for Singapore, yes. okay. But the big center essentially is London, the big cap international capital markets uh, center is really London. And also New York is very big because of the uh, size of the domestic capital markets. So what is this 5%? 5% is the coupon, coupon. So they mentioned the coupon. So it, obviously if a bond is issued at par, okay. And then uh, if you see the YTM on the bond, okay, if the bond is issued at par, the YTM will be what? More than the coupon or greater than the coupon? Greater than the coupon. 
If it is issued at par, the YTM is the coup and the coupon will be the same. Okay. So essentially, now, so you'll find out that uh, this this five percent here is referring to the coupon rate. Okay, coupon rate and when is it due? Okay. All right. Now, uh, so okay, LIBOR. What will happen in LIBOR if you are using issuing an FRN? Okay. Let's say the Intel FRN. <coughs> okay. Due. Same thing. Okay. Normally you don't have such long FRNs, but let's say whatever it is. Let's say we we'll make it uh, twenty. Uh, 26 okay now this um, okay here now what you have to specify is because there's there's a problem here do you see something else has to be specified frn you understand what so frn is huh? so frn is a floating rate note okay frn stands for floating rate note okay so let me just write it here if you don't want if you don't because we haven't discussed uh debt capital markets um, Okay, floating rate note. Okay, all that it means is it's just like a bond, but it's uh, the coupon is not a fixed rate, but it's a floating rate. So it is priced at a spread over a LIBOR uh, rate. Okay, but what is the problem with LIBOR? If I just say if I just say Intel uh, FRN due uh, 2026 priced at uh, 210 over. Okay, is this uh, is this uh, information complete? No, no, Even if I write no, no. LIBOR, what is the com what is the problem? Sir, LIBOR rate is missing and uh, the, so the, 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 the majority of one minute. minute. LIBOR rate is missing. LIBOR rate no. you can find from the internet. And uh, it is uh, like uh, LIBOR rate is a second change after every six or nine months. And so that's why it's a floating rate note. Uh, is my question clear? One minute. Let's be very clear about the question. Earlier, when I priced, when I gave you information on the five-year bond, on the on the fixed rate bond issued by Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, if this news release tells you everything you need to know, okay, this will also mention five percent semi-annual or annual, okay. This you can uh, this news release may not mention because the five percent coupon, whether it's paid semi-annually or paid annually, those things will be mentioned that you look at at the term sheet, okay. But it will definitely not be mentioned in the in the uh, news release. Now. Uh, Intel FRN due 2026. It's a 10 year, let's say it's a 10 year FRN. Okay, due 2026, and this news release is coming out in 2016. If we say priced at 210 over LIBOR, okay, let's make it a different spread. Okay, even if they write 75 BP. Okay, what is the problem here? What information is missing? Is my question clear? Yes. So Intel issues a 10 year FRN in 2016, <coughs> let's say, which is priced at 75 basis points over LIBOR. Okay, and uh, it's due in, in, in 10 years. Now, obviously, now here there is no mention of coupon. There's no mention of a coupon. Is that clear? There's no mention of a coupon because there is a this is a fixed rate. Uh, this is a floating rate bond. Okay, a floating rate note. So there's no mention of a coupon. Okay. Now it is that's why what they are mentioning is 75 basis points over LIBOR. Okay. Now what is the problem? What information is missing? Credit rating. You don't need the credit rating. It's only telling you how much uh, Intel has had to pay. It's reporting on a bond issue, on an FRN issuance. Yes. Size of bond. Say US bond. No, no. It's okay. Let me just save time. And it's not the size of the bond. Is it? The point is, LIBOR is how many LIBORs do you get? Majority. LIBOR is in London Interbank offer rate. Okay, so this is actually a money market rate. LIBOR is a money market rate. When we did our case on uh, this Magma resources, didn't I give you guys a write up on LIBOR? Yes, you So, is LIBOR fixed for how many maturities is LIBOR fixed for? Six months. Six months. It's not just for one majority. LIBOR is fixed for one month, three months, six months, yeah. nine months, twelve months. Okay, it may be done for two months also. Okay, so London, uh, London, and LIBOR is fixed for different maturities. Yeah. It tells you all the borrowing costs of the money center banks in London for various maturities. So LIBOR on any given day is published for multiple maturities. So you have three one month LIBOR, two you can have two month LIBOR also, three month LIBOR, six month LIBOR, nine month LIBOR, etc. So what is missing here? is the, the particular benchmark of uh, for the frn 
the, when you are when you are setting a LIBOR benchmark for an FRN, you need to fix the term of LIBOR. Okay, you need to specify most of them will be for three month LIBOR. Okay, most of the FRNs will be issued against three month LIBOR because remember three month LIBOR is not the same as six month LIBOR. Yes, sir. So on any given day, you will have fixings for one month, let's say two months, and then three months, six months, nine months, twelve months. On any given day, for each currency. Now I think they're doing uh, US dollar. They cut down. They kicked out Aussie and Canada. So uh, under the new system. So now you have uh, US dollars, sterling, and probably Swiss francs and yen. Okay, maybe four currencies. Okay, but for each currency, they're going to fix LIBOR for. Uh, at least uh, the three uh, at least for one month two months three months six months nine months twelve months okay is this clear so the one month on any given day one month LIBOR is not the same as three month LIBOR the value is this clear because your borrowing rates are not the same for different maturities so therefore when you're fixing a benchmark for a floating rate bar, a debt issue you need to specify what is the term of LIBOR against which you're benchmarking is it six month LIBOR is it three month LIBOR is this clear? Yes. The, otherwise, the information is not complete. So here I've written three month. Most of the debt issues are going to be against three month LIBOR because that's uh, that also when you later on when you study interest rate swaps, uh, most dollar interest rate swaps, the standard uh, LIBOR reference is to three month LIBOR. So because most people would like to have the option to swap into fixed rate dollars later on to keep the regularity in the majority they usually would issue the FRN against three month LIBOR, but it's not, it's not a, like a hard and fast rule. You can also decide to issue against six month LIBOR. All that it means is that if you're issuing against three month LIBOR means your interest rate gets reset every three months. Okay. Remember this is bond the, issued in 2016. This bond is issued in 2016 and it matures in 2026. Okay. So every three months. So you only know when you issue the bond, you know, the fixed interest rate payment only for the first quarter. Second quarter's interest rate you don't know now. You will know it only after three months. This is clear. That's why it's a floating rate issue. All right. So these 10 essentially are 39 quarters. 10 years you have four quarters in every year, 40 quarters total. But the first quarter's interest rate is known because when you issue the, uh, when you issue the FRN, you already know what the LIBOR is for that day. So three months later, you'll have to pay interest according to that interest rate. But whatever you have to pay for Q2, Q3, Q4, and all the next 39 quarters, that is not known to you. Is this clear? Yes, LIBOR is decided depends on the liquidity in the market. That's why it's, I'm just coming to that. That's why it's called a floating rate note. Is everyone clear about this? Okay. So then obviously for FRNs, you have to mention when you're talking about the benchmark, it's LIBOR, you have to mention whether it's HIBOR, LIBOR, MIBOR, whatever it is. Okay. That you have to mention and you also have to mention the maturity. I mean the term of LIBOR. Three months, is it three months, is it six months, is it nine months against which it will be measured? Is this clear? Yes, well, what is your question? Sir, Use the mic if you can. The LIBOR is depending on the liquidity in the market or the okay. demand and supply of the money in the LIBOR, the LIBOR uh, interest rate. Yeah, so see, what is LIBOR if you remember? Does anyone remember how LIBOR is fixed? Okay, so there have been some changes to the mechanism. Now it is called ICE LIBOR. ICE is the Intercontinental Exchange because there was a massive LIBOR fixing scandal. Okay, that happened in uh, in the aftermath of the uh, uh, GFC. Okay, in 2008-9. So essentially, how LIBOR used to be fixed was the uh, British Bankers Association would go and call because remember London is a very big financial center. So you have banks from all over the world: Sumitomo, Mitsubishi, Westpac, everybody. Canadian Imperial Bank, it's everybody's got big branches in London and they're all borrowing between each other, uh, from each other, lending to each other. This is called the Euro markets. Okay. So in this market, when they're borrowing with each other, borrowing, lending to each other, the B BBA, the British Bankers Association would pull, so it's a survey, LIBOR was a survey, essentially. Today also, it's also a survey, but it's better controlled, hopefully. So it's a, it was a survey, okay, and they would survey the banks and say, okay, you call up Barclays London and you say that, okay, Today, if you have to lend to your um, other money center banks, okay, uh, at what rate will you lend for each of these maturities? So then Barclays will say that for one month I would lend at, uh, or at what rate are you able to borrow? Okay, then they will be po separately po polled also for lending. So you're at rate, at what rate do you think you can borrow for these maturities? Okay, is this clear? It's a survey. So you call up the various banks and you figure out what are their borrowing rates for various maturities in each of those currencies and the earlier days they used to have Aussie and Canada as well. Those banks who have surplus funds would like to 
lend at the lesser interest rates and those who well, why would you lend at the little interest rate i want to borrow money from you if you want to lend if you are a lender you want a lower interest rate or a higher those interest rate who so they would like that their <coughs> money should be given to those their money should be lended and not lended there is no such thing as lended lent lent so sir jo bhi use the mic use the mic where is the mic ंग्रेटिंग of these various banks trying to figure out at what rate they are, they are able to borrow today what oh, at what rate do you think you can borrow today for one month two month three month six month nine month in say swiss francs and then repeat this exercise for all the other currencies and then you poll you i think they were polling about 11 banks or 14 banks and then they would leave out the two most extreme observations and then take an average of the rest okay so this is just a uh, this is a survey data i mean essentially libor is survey data but libor is very important because trillions of dollars of debt worldwide are priced off libor okay literally because the us capital markets are the us dollar capital markets are the deepest in the world so everybody is trying to issue in those markets and this is the volume of debt uh, which is priced off libor is massive okay huge amounts of libor and now they are trying to transition to some other uh, benchmarks as well i forget the name of the benchmark i think it's secured uh, something i'll have to look it up and tell you but there's a new benchmark now which the US, i think it's this um, sofa it's called secured overnight funding rate okay so for because of the scandals in the libor fixing they have tried to move towards because libor is based on survey data okay libor is based on survey data hmm? the data must be biased yeah so that this whole libor scandal you guys should also be aware of this what happened in the libor scandal is because many of these money center banks had bad uh, assets on their books okay as you know many of the banks were they had to be taken over they had to be bailed out by the government so they had a lot of bad assets on their books so their credit ratings essentially i mean they were uh, downgraded much later but the market did not want to lend money to them okay the market was very wary of dealing with them so therefore they wanted to understate the rates at which they were able to borrow actually they were not able to borrow at such high rates but they lied essentially they lied about that's why libor was started being referred to as libor so the joke in the industry was this that libor was called libor libor okay so this was called libor and there's a um, this is a very big scandal actually uh, this is a case study in itself libor and uh, what um, so what happened uh, in uh, in the uh, in in uh, i got distracted because i saw gunjan looking at the clock <laughs> so all right so uh, so this was called libor because the bank so you have to understand the libor scandal we don't have enough time to cover it but at least you should understand the basic idea is first you have to understand the libor used to be a survey it is still a survey as it stands okay but hopefully it's conducted with better checks and balances so they would just go and ask the banks how much do you think you'll have to pay to borrow at 3 months uh, for 3 months in swiss francs 9 months in swiss francs etc and so repeat for all the currencies like we fix our monetary policy or any central bank fix sorry sir why not we use the mic why not we fix the libor rates as we decide our monetary policy or any country economy decides uh, monetary policies like there are five people in the monetary policy and they vote in favor or against the no that libor is intended to be a market rate so what is actually happening in sofa what is happening and sofa is uh, in sofa they are trying to uh, go move from survey data they are trying to move from survey data to actual transactions so the idea behind sofa is to now base the uh, cost of borrowing on instead of basing it on a survey which led to all these problems of the scandal of libor and uh, they are trying to now base it on actual borrowing transactions in the market between money center banks so that is much more realistic because actual transactions don't lie okay no one will lend to a poor credit at a low interest rate all right so essentially what happened was try to understand the libor scandal this is also important from the point of view of understanding the history of financial markets that essentially what happened in libor because the uh, in the gfc uh, these uh, all these residential mortgage bonds were falling okay the banks had bad assets on their books nobody would lend to them 
so the banks try to understate their risk, the quality of their uh, the, the problems with their credit quality so when they were being asked at what rate do you think you can borrow they were actually uh, quoting very low rates but in fact they were not able to borrow at those rates they were able to borrow only at much higher rates but if they had disclosed to the market that the cost of borrowings for banks is going up markets would have concluded that this means that people think these banks are much risky much riskier than we think mm. right obviously you will charge higher interest rates if you are going to lend to a riskier uh, riskier borrower right so profit would be eaten up by the rate and the interest payments yeah profit would be eaten up by the interest payments so these banks they wanted to conceal the extent of the credit pr problems on their books and the, the the decline in their actual credit quality and so they started to lie about the rates at which they were able to borrow so LIBOR became artificially depressed and artificially low okay for this period and eventually the scandal was investigated a lot of people were sent to jail That's what okay there is, need, there is need of regulators in the market the other day you were saying that we should free the market that is what the need well i don't agree that i don't agree because actually uh, in the first place it was a stupid system to base such an important index on a sur on survey data you should you could have already seen the conflict of interest that if there is any situation where banks have an, everything in law in in the in economics is based on incentives okay economics most of the laws don't work but there's only one law that always works okay which is that people respond to incentives okay so that so if you had a system which is basically uh, like somebody has a famous quotation that uh, you show me the incentive and i'll show you the crime Okay, you have to see where the incentives of people are in the system based on the system how it's how it's uh, designed, and you can already predict what kind of problem is going to come up. So it was a stupid system in the first place. Okay, and so this move towards SOFA is much better because it's based on actual transactions. All right, you'll get slightly delayed data, but that still work okay because the quality of the data is much better. Okay, so I don't agree that it necessarily requires regulation. I mean, it, this is not a case for regulation. Okay. So, uh, so is this point? So, LIBOR essentially that's the problem. That's a LIBOR scandal. So, eventually they investigated these people and they put them in jail. All right. Okay. So, this is the pricing of floating rate notes and fixed rate notes. Okay. Now, let's quickly go. And uh, this I've already written and I've already told you guys about all this. Okay. Um, I think this is also I put this in your folder. So, the last thing that we have left. Remember, the entire discussion is happening in the uh, list of. Uh, to discuss the prototypical firms in the financial services sector and the last entity that we have while discussing the government treasury we had a long discussion on the uh, debt capital markets which is very important for you to understand how the market works okay uh, and uh, so the last thing that is left is the corporate treasury uh, that is the CFO's office okay we can okay let this be so this uh, will just okay one last thing I wanted to tell you before uh, this This is a very common mistake that people make in the market. So I just wanted to um, write down two statements which you should be aware of. Okay, it's it's common sense, but one problem that you'll have is let's say I'm not going to write yields. I'm going to write YTM. Okay, this is one mistake that many so-called professionals also make in the market. So you need to be aware of this. Uh, you should not make this mistake. It's very common sense actually, but still people make this mistake. So remember, what are the two components of the treasury yield? One by one, one by one. Give him the mic, give Gava the mic. Is the question clear? What are the two components? It's like I ask you, what are the two components of chocolate? Let's assume it's uh, cocoa and milk. Okay, and sugar, cocoa and milk and sugar. So in that sense, I'm asking, what is the two? What are the two components of the treasury yield? What is the treasury yield made up of? It consists of two parts. Real rate of return. Yeah, real rate of return. Expected return. Right. Yeah. So the target real, the investor's real rate of return. So you can call it the target rate of rate of return and the, the TROR and expected inflation. Okay. So one mistake which you see very often, people even uh, in the markets make. Okay, even so-called experts, they see a rise in the treasury yield. Okay, like you see a rise like this in the treasury yield. If you look at uh, this data from, uh, you know, just just this 
this entire rise that has happened here okay this is from the time of uh, the 2016 election this rise in the treasury yield people were saying that uh, so you'll see that there's a rise in the trade on any given day if the treasury yield goes up uh, export will come up and say oh the markets inflation expectations are going up okay but as Mansi has just clarified the treasury yield consists always of two parts this is mechanical okay target tror plus expected inflation okay so do you think it's logically correct to automatic if you see a rise in the total treasury yield can you always necessarily assume that the inflation expectations no. have gone up no, 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 you no. can't you have to check what happened to the tror obviously is that correct Yes, is that logical yes, because you don't know which component went up by what amount okay maybe one component went up and one went down you don't know okay sorry we are changing the weight of giving something component we are changing the weight for example for some time we are considering the growth as a factor and we are giving the market is giving the more yeah you can look at it as changing the weight but there's no weight as such here it just consists of two parts basically okay there's no concept in a mathematical sense there's no weight but i understand what you're trying to say that the market gives so please make don't make this mistake if somebody makes this mistake you point it out that the treasury yield is well. i'll tell you why actually i did some research on this part if you see the rise and in the interest rate since uh, this low okay to this high from this low to this high okay you will find that actually and where do we find the tror Treasury yield you can find from the US Treasury website. And what is the TROR? What did we discuss? Where can I find the TROR? Yes? Tip seal, right? The tip seal is the TROR. Okay, the tip seal again you can find from the US Treasury. Okay, so therefore, when you see that, let's say the total treasury, the all in treasury yield has gone up from, say, let's say uh, this point, uh, whatever, let's say it has gone from uh, this here. 1.3 say it's gone from 1.3 to 3.3 okay so the total treasury yield has gone up by two percent <coughs> now what you have to go and do is if you before you make a statement about uh, what has happened to the market's inflation expectations you have to go and check what happened to the tip seal in the same period okay so if you do the research on this you will find approximately about 67 percent of the movement in the uh, uh, treasury yield the total treasury yield is explained by a rise in the tip seed okay so therefore it's not necessarily always true to uh, correct to say that uh, inflation experience logically that is not a correct conclusion you have to first check what's happening to the tip seed is this clear so the same logic applies to so you have to go and check as in for instance i can tell you because i've done the research myself for this part here 67 percent two-thirds of the rise is driven by the rise in the tror yes which means essentially and because and these things are important because the uh, a rise in the target real rate of return you should understand has very different implication if you find that the market is radically raising the target real rate of return okay that has very different implications from another situation where the market is raising its inflation expectations because target real rate of return rising means market is expecting an economic downturn or upturn downturn Upturn. Normally, we associate a rising target real rate of return with a upturn. economic upturn because no, no, there's no India US in this. This is just theory. This is theory which applies everywhere in the same way. Target real rate of return is what the investor expects in a uh, uh, from an investment. Okay. So obviously, if, uh, if you are looking at the corporate view, yeah, there it is against them. Target real rate of return is always discussed from the investor's point of view, not from the corporate's point of view, not from the corporate borrower's point of view. Is everyone clear about this? Yes. If you have any doubts, let's clarify it now. So I mean, don't just take it just because I'm shouting and telling you this. Okay. That the target real rate of return, you should understand it. If it doesn't make any sense, then you can think about it and you can ask me later or you can ask me now. A ta normally we associate the theory that doesn't change whether you go to India or Japan or US or wherever okay the theory is the ta TROR is rising means that investors are being more demanding because obviously there's as the economy is growing there's greater demand for funds okay so therefore these people feel also that there is also more of the, the borrowers can pay more because there is a period of high growth therefore uh, everybody is kind of making money all businesses are making money by and large okay because markets are expanding so therefore uh, revenues are growing etc so therefore uh, the borrowers are also in a position to pay more 
and the lenders also feel that okay if hey, you don't want to borrow from me i've got a double a here who's desperate to borrow as well because he also sees everyone sees growth opportunities in a strong economy right are you following the logic okay so make sure you understand all these uh, all these components properly and what they mean by contrast to this so rising tror means the market expects a strong economic growth Economic yeah strong economic upturn of growth so that's why and so what is explained is part and you see how it makes sense because this is the time you were because Trump was elected and he had promised tax cuts and radical deregulation and radical deregulation had a huge impact on consumer confidence business small business confidence okay and this economic growth started picking up now you see wages are also going up then you got the tax cuts after one year unemployment, unemployment has fallen okay and you got the tax cuts so this is consistent with what actually happened as well Okay, so the market, so the movement in the uh, total treasury yield is 67% is explained by the movement in the TROR, which means that the market, what the bond market was expecting uh, a period of uh, rising e um, strong economic growth and which was actually borne out by the results. But sir, uh, in a long run, we have to keep in mind the perspective of both the investors and the corporate uh, borrowers. So sir, uh, it should not be no, it is the it only statement that the increasing trend would, would be a beneficial for no, no, what I'm trying to say, uh, no, I, I don't know which part are you objecting to. What I'm explaining is the theoretical understanding, okay, of uh, a rising TROR is that that is normally associated with a, uh, with a market view. If you find that the TROR is increasing, okay, that means that the debt market overall is expecting a period of strong economic growth. Okay. In, is, in India, uh, if the central bank is rising the interest rate, not rising the raising, raising the interest rate. So, sir, it is not. Uh, uh, use the mic. Use the, the mic. market is not considering it as a favorable uh, instrument. No, I understand what you're trying to say. I, what you're trying to say is that if rates keep rising, then uh, it will be bad for the corporate sector. Okay, and, and bad again. There's a. This is the narrative that normally gets played out in India. Okay which to some extent is true in other countries as well but there is something else uh, there's another part of the picture that is not discussed that is that if you are actually it is partly to do with the maybe the overall macro uh, you know uh, dampeners on a potential economic growth okay if you i'm talking about a period where uh, the market is expecting strong economic growth so if, if the so this logic is not 100 percent correct See, if a period, what happens is if you are expecting a, mac, a macro period uh, uh, in the macro economy, if you are expecting strong growth, like what you've seen in the first two years of the Trump administration in the US, it's been a dramatic economic turnaround. Wages are rising, okay? Economic growth is very strong, okay? In unemployment is falling, labor force participation is increasing, people are coming in. I just heard yesterday that Walmart is hiring truck drivers at $92,000 uh, 92, a year. <coughs> Truck drivers. These are guys who are coming out of jail. These are people who have no, they have no qualifications. Okay, so even people are coming out of jail. People with who are high school dropouts, they are getting ninety-two thousand. Welders are being paid six-figure salaries. Construction. There's a massive construction boom. Welders are being paid six-figure salaries, and still they can't. There are one million jobs in the U.S. for which there are no people. No. <laughs> so that's why you see that they are actually going to see now you see this there's also a narrative in the Indian business press that you know this uh, uh, the uh, immigration restrictions are not going to be yeah, actually in the long run this is good for India if the US moves to a merit based system because most of the Indian immigrants are they have merit most of them you have some cheaters here and there who are going into fraud universities and all that but by and large most of our immig Indian immigrants from here to the US they are all skilled immigrants we are not like unskilled laborer from Mexico or some or Honduras or somewhere going there most of our guys are quite well educated so this is actually good for India if they move to a skilled uh, labor immigration system which will take a lot of time I think but this is what so are you following the discussion here yes sir. okay so we got we are getting sidetracked once again a little bit but uh, uh, the point is that TROR, rising TROR means market is expecting strong economic growth. Is this clear? Aryanth is not convinced. We can say in a long run, for a long run. Yeah, I mean, in the, see, if uh, the point I was trying to make here is that, see, in this narrative that I don't agree all the time that this rising interest rates means that it's bad for the corporate sector. Okay, yes, the cost of borrowing will go up. But the point is that if the funds are not going to be available unless you pay that marginally higher interest rate, okay, 
if the overall if you're looking at strong growth then you don't mind paying that higher interest rate that's another factor which never gets reflected in the discussion okay Good. part of the problem is our overall macroeconomic growth potential is depressed because of all kinds of bad policies yes. so if you have a booming economy why are people paying $92,000 why is Walmart paying 92 does anyone want to pay $92,000 to a truck driver they could have also decided not to hire the truck driver, but they are hiring the truck driver at ninety-two thousand dollars because their business is booming. Yes. Are you following the logic? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sir, but if any business is booming on the cost of debt, then there is not not, not a point to carrying on the business. No, no, no. So use the mic first. Oh, what? One minute. If I am making total assets, one minute. This is also an important financial relationship you guys should be aware of. Okay let's go use this discussion to go and uh, because I want to make sure because corporate most of your interview questions are based on uh, corporate uh, financial statement analysis is that correct yes sir. most of your financial statements okay are you following what Goel said uh -huh. Goel said it's no point raising money and by borrowing money at high interest rates if uh, now doesn't matter what the growth is right that's what Goel is saying okay now I'll write two more uh, points here but there's very important return on total assets <laughs> okay <laughs> who is minus two <laughs> who <laughs> okay no he oh, okay he's okay i ban banned people from going out no but he should have asked me but sir he was talking so hard yes, <laughs> okay okay fine no problem okay uh, but generally, if you want to go out, you have to inform me then. If you have just told me that I've never stopped anybody from going out when they're not well. Okay. One minute. Let let this is an important thing that you have to understand. Okay. Return on total assets. Okay. Is one. Then second is. Um, Okay, so there are three factors. What Goyal is saying is that no matter what essentially what Goyal is saying is the point I was trying to uh, you know, highlight to him, which I think everybody should understand because again in the Indian debate, this point does not get reflected. We have this standard, you know, all these guys uh, from Fiki and Asocham go and start crying every time. They, I mean, their interest rate should always be cut. Interest rate should always be cut. That's kind of also a little bit, uh, I mean, I understand the logic. But the point is, it misses the point. We should be emphasizing other factors which are holding back macroeconomic growth potential in this country, like you know, pro prop improper tax system, Policy. then uh, regulator excessive regulation. That that doesn't get addressed with if all you're doing is going and crying about uh, you know cutting the interest rate. So the point that Goyal is making is what Goyal is saying: no matter what your return on total assets, if your cost of debt is going up, you should not borrow. That is, I'm, I'm twisting your words a little bit. But are you following what he's saying? Yes. That is kind of what Goyal's message is. No matter what a total return on prospective return on total assets, obviously you never know actually actually what the return will be. But prospectively, everything works on uh, pro future prospects. All business investment is made on based on future prospects. You actually really don't know what's going to happen, right? So, so what Goyal is saying is that no matter what the prospective return on total assets, if your after-tax cost of debt is going up, okay, you should not invest. Okay, that's what he's saying. Because it done on equity codes. No, but here's the relationship. This is the identity. Okay, this is the mathematical relationship. Whenever, if my return on total assets exceeds my act after tax, so make sure you understand this. Okay, this is part of your financial statement analysis logic. Okay. So whenever, if your return on total assets exceeds your after tax cost of debt, your or ROE is always going to go up. If your return on total assets exceeds your if your exceeds your after tax cost of debt, your ROE is always going to go up. Okay, this is the this is mathematical. There is no uh, okay. Is everyone clear about this? If you're not clear about this, please make sure you take some time to understand it or understand it later. Okay, this is an important. This goes into your module on financial statement analysis. Okay, which is what most of the question interview questions are on, right? So make sure you understand. So what is Goel saying? So therefore, what therefore what Goel say is saying doesn't make sense. 
okay now you understand why corporates are willing to pay higher interest rates okay and why the tror might go up in a situation where uh, the overall debt market is seeing a dramatic economic upturn okay because investors see that okay if you are not willing to borrow money from me he is there to borrow money from because everybody is looking for funds why because in an economic upturn essentially what's happening is the prospective return on total assets is going up so as long as i see a prospective return on total assets okay rota on uh, which is a greater than my after tax cost of debt okay now remember here between 1 and 2 which is certain between 1 and 2 which is certain second is certain at the time i raise when i raise five year finance okay once i've locked in the raising of five year finance my cost of debt is fixed unless it's an frn then i have a problem but then again i can do an interest rate swap and i can fix it in various ways there are various ways to manage interest rate risk but generally once i so number two is certain okay so i can lock in a certain on number two but obviously number one is not certain okay nothing number one is never going to be certain pretty much okay so but if you are reasonably confident about getting a high number one <coughs> compared to number much much higher than number two then you should always so if your ROA is projected to go up you should invest or you should not invest yes. you should invest right is this clear yes sir okay so therefore it's not true to say that you should always so what you said is not correct so there's also something to understand that when when the uh, these people from Fiki and Asocham are going and always crying about lowering interest rates that they are missing an opportunity to point the finger at other problems which are holding other policy deficiencies which are holding back this country's macroeconomic growth potential okay like the need for deregulation and all these kinds of things okay so another point so the first point that i was making is that the rise in the treasury ytm does not necessarily mean that inflation expectations are rising okay uh, just for you because tror may have gone up okay as i showed you in the case of the 2016 2018 rise in u.s treasury yields okay uh, that is 67 percent of that is explained by the rise in the tror okay so you have to check the tip seal also the other mistake that people make obviously is therefore rise in due to um, okay is this clear is everyone clear about this same logic so if the total corporate debt uh, the total cost of corporate debt has gone up it need not necessarily imply that uh, the credit spread has gone up you have to really check what has happened to each of the components it may be that the credit spread went up but the it was uh, the credit spread went down actually but it was more than offset by the rise in the benchmark bond yield so be careful about all these mistakes because you will see actually see professionals making mistakes like this with respect to the interpretation of treasury bond yield movements uh, when they automatically in, uh, attribute it to inflation expectations okay so don't make this mistake okay and so this other learning that we have related to uh, financial statement analysis all right so all these things can change depending on situation yeah, what can change these assumptions can change which assumptions can change this does not change this one minute this is mathematical this does not change be clear about this this is mathematical the problem here obviously is that your rota is not certain okay when maruti is setting up its new plant in sanan they actually don't know what the rota will act will end up being they have a projection okay but all kinds of stuff can happen because it will take probably 10 15 years to realize all those uh, returns so those are but the point is mathematically if your assumption is correct about the rota being much higher than the cost of debt okay which is known to you and the return on equity is just a residual in this equation so this never changed mathematically this never changes the only problem in this is that the rota is not certain so suppose at the time you take the investment decision the rota is not certain it is subject to whims uh, to the 
uh, changing tides in the economy. So suppose we have just started the business. Yeah, one minute. Let us see if we have a time problem. No, no, yes, sir. Sir. We have three minutes. We have yeah. two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Sir, yes, let him let him complete his question. Sir, suppose we have started. Use the mic. Use the mic. Okay. Who is talking at the back? Yes. Suppose sir, we have started just started the new business. So sir, in the initial period, the for say uh, hotel business, so sir, uh, the ROI would be much more lower than the again much more lower. Much lower much than lower. the uh, cost of the debt. So sir. So return one minute. So return on total assets. So you he's only talking about a situation where again this gives us an opportunity to link it to your placement decisions. Okay. Do you reject if you have a project with has a positive NPV but the first two three years cash flows are negative? Do you reject that project? No, sir. No. So similarly, when you are looking at your placement, don't take it uh, based on the first two three years cash flows. Look at the NPV of the project. Okay. <laughs> so what he is saying is that the NPV of the of a particular project may be what negative in the first two years so when you are looking at this rota calculation here the rota projection is the total return that you are expected to make okay so you look at the IRR of the project here when I mean I, uh, rota I am talking about the IRR that's a projection you don't know what is actually going to happen is this clear yes. have you guys learned anything today yes sir. Okay, very good Okay, please remember I'm going to send you that report, uh, the spreadsheet format. I want people to respond quickly. Okay, all right. Who were the defaulting teams? I think I've shut that sheet now. Okay, so when you get the make sure that everyone responds. Okay, you can go 35 seconds. You get 25 seconds bonus. Yes, is it a technical question? Sir, regarding the business. Yes. Go ahead. 5% bond over 210. Sorry, 5% bond? One minute. One minute. One minute. Thank you. KSA 5% bonds due 2046. Is this the one you're talking about? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hi. This one only. This one. Ah, yes. This question. What is your question? Sir, this five percent is the coupon rate. So then, what is two ten to two point ten? This is the credit spread. Thirty years two ten over. Yeah, that's the credit spread. Credit spread. Sir, he use ka apne credit spread sir. Sorry, one minute. Come again. Sir. I think your confusion is between uh, coupon rate and white year. Yes, sir. So coupon rate is less important. So white is just like the IRR of the board. Yes. Okay. Correct. Very good. Correct. Excellent. So white year is like the IRR of the board. Okay. Right. So now the question is, uh, don't get confused by the, the coupon is just uh, incidental information, a piece of incidental information that is given to you to show you what the, uh, what the bond's coupon is. Obviously when you actually buy the bond, the money that you're going to earn, the actual cash payments that will come to you on a semi-annual basis or whatever the frequency is, is going to be based on the coupon. Okay. But what really matters in the market is the white here. So YTM is the yield on the bond, it's the, it's the yield to maturity on the bond. So okay, let's the IRR say, on the bond, as you correctly Let's say said. government bond yield is 5%. Yeah. Then the YTM will be 7.1%. Yes. 7.1%. Sir, but the YTM will include the coupon? No. One minute. One minute. Coupon is the dividend. It's just like that. The ITR, yeah. The IRR is the, uh, the YTM is the IRR on the bond. Yes, sir. The coupon is just like that periodic cash flow which you're discounting. Yes, sir. You're following? Yes, sir. So that periodic cash flow which you discount in the project to get the IRR. Yes, sir. In that place when you are calculating the bonds of ITM, that periodic cash flow will be based on the coupon times the par value, the principal. So if it is a bond with uh, you know thousand dollars face value, you will get for every bond that you have bought five percent per annum. Okay, paid semi annually, or let's say assume for the sake of simplicity annually, then five percent on the thousand uh, dollar face value. Coupon will be paid for you for every bond. That is your cash flow. So, so the cash flow is different from the discount rate. In the basic structure of your uh, you know uh, project return analysis, etc. The cash flow is different from the interest rate from the discount rate. The IRR is a discount rate. Yes. So and the cash flows are the coupons. 
let's go down this. Yeah. So what so are the computers? Sir, so the thing is that these bond prices change in the market. Yes. Sir, so but the YTM remains the same. No. The coupon remains the same. Coupon remains the same. YTM will change the next YTM, year. YTM, see, one minute. Coupon remains the same. Yes, sir. If coupon remains the same and the prices are changing in the market, yes, sir. then is the YTM remaining constant? No, no. sir. The YTM will change as yes, the prices sir. change. Yes, sir. Okay? Because remember the YTM, the price, think about this. One minute. Go back to the, the good example that you gave. The pr price, the, the, the price of the bond hmm. is equal to the cost of the project. Think uh, of the price of the bond as the cost of the project. And when your the IRR, IRR is basically on the right hand side, one way of writing the IRR is on the right hand side you put the actual project cash flow values, uh -huh. NPVs of the cash flow values. Uh -huh. And the, on the left hand side you put the project cost. When, they are two, when the two are equal, then the IRR is uh, that is the IRR of the price. Yes, that is the discount rate. Okay, yes, so here, if you want to put the bond pricing into that framework, the cost of the project will be the market price of the bond. <laughs> the cash flows will be the coupon rates times the principal. Coupon rate times the principal. Uh, times the principal and plus the terminal uh, redeem redeem the value of the bond. Uh, principal value that uh, plus at the last period you have the coupon payment, the yes, payment yes, of principal. Okay. Yes, sir. And then the discount rate is the, going to be the IRR, the, that which makes the LHS equal to the IR, R, RHS. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Now you understand. So when the coupon doesn't change after the issue, the coupon doesn't change. Uh, coupon the same. Okay. Will be same. Okay. But what will change is that because the market wants to receive always wants to receive the market rate of return on the bonds, uh -huh. the market rate of interest. Right. So the market will make the price go up and down to get the YTM that it wants. That it wants. Is this clear now? Yes, sir. Okay. That's why you are also following? Yeah. Go and listen to it. It's all recorded. Yes, yes, it yes. That's why I asked you whether it's a technical question. Then I wouldn't stop the recording. Yes. So we had a long technical discussion. Yes. So just last thing. Yes. Can I go and ask many things? First line is for the primary debt issue. Yes. Yeah. BCM. But for the next time when it will be for the secondary market. BCM. Secondary debt. Yes. Yes. BCM. So I am talking for a news release about a PCM transaction. So I was confused that the market. Change every year. The uh, news media, like the specialized news media, like International Financing Review, they would not report on secondary market transactions unless there's something special. There's a large block trade or something. So that was that was the reason I was confused that it should change every year. The white team should it change. change. Every year. Depending on how actively you share it, it can change all the time. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good question. <laughs> And it's good that you understood that. Uh, Please the explain that statement, uh, which one was it? Show me the incentive, and I will show you the crime. What that statement is exactly? Uh, incentive is essentially. Uh, come with me. I'll explain that to you. So incentive and showing you the crime means essentially people respond to incentives. See, why do people not talk that much in the class? Because they know if I catch them, I'm, they're going to lose CP points. Yeah. So people are responding to incentives. If I did not do that, then they would talk a lot. Okay. So, 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 so.